Um, anyway, I'd like to introduce Dr. Matthew Watkins uh, to the colloquium. Uh, Matthew has a PhD from Kent University in infinite dimensional geometry. Um, Matthew actually is an honorary research fellow here at Exeter and has taught mathematics at Exeter. I didn't realize that until today, so welcome back. Um, Matthew, he lives in Devon as well. He's probably mostly known for the so-called Watkins objection, which is an objection to Terence McKenna's time wave zero theory. I'm sure people will ask you more about this in the Q&A. Um, Matthew is also a DJ and he's playing um, at our conference on the from the 28th of, well our conference on from the 28th to 30th of June. Um, tickets are now back online apparently. Um, Matthew has published a trilogy of books on the distribution of prime numbers and the Riemann hypothesis and um, I'm, very, I'm very much interested in this talk so thanks a lot for coming and uh, we'll go on for about 45 minutes and then I'll take Q&A. Right, might do a little bit more. Might, I'll try not to go over 45, but um, see how we get on. Okay, so I was uh, thanks for coming, everyone, and uh, thanks for inviting me. And uh, I was originally invited to speak about um, ask if I, oh, um, uh, uh, slideshow. Um, I was asked if I wanted to speak about about my encounter with Terence McKenna back in 1996. You might you might know who he is. Um, this is him with his time wave software, which supposedly predicted the end of uh, time in 2012, which seemingly didn't come up. But um, I met him in 96 and, and uh, our discussion sort of led to the downfall of his theory, which not, not something I was really seeking to do, but that's what came out of it. This is the book that it original, originated with uh, in 1975, co-written with his brother Dennis, who actually went on to be a serious psychopharmacologist, um, who I think is going to be speaking here at some point. Somebody told me. Um, Terence was a bit, he was a great entertainer, a great speaker, um, but a bit of a charlatan, I'd say. So if you want to know more about the Watkins objection, as he called it, I didn't call it that, um, you can find it as there's, there's a lot about it online. I got, I've been asked to speak about this many times and it's a bit boring to me now. Um, so I'll move on and speak about something which um, I'm interested in these days, which is what I've, what I've been involved in recently. Um, so Last year, unexpectedly, I got recruited to work in long-term AI safety. Um, in other words, trying to make the world safe from dangerous future super intelligent machines. It's a very strange world to find myself in. And it's populated by a lot of people I can't really relate to. Um, there are a lot of them have come out of computer science and they're, they're um, generally they're sort of hardcore reductionists, materialists who believe that um, the brain is basically a, com a computer and that we can uh, create intelligence in a, in a computer context. Um, and I've had a lot of debates with, with these types of um, sort of hyper-rationalists. There's this online rationalist community you may or may not have come across that sort of aggregates around a couple of blogs. One of them is called Less Wrong. One is called the Alignment Forum. Very, very bright people, but who have a very different worldview to me. And uh, one of the, one of the question, um, issues that comes up in debating the nature of reality is, uh, well, psychedelic experience. I often bring this up because it, to me, it challenges their sort of reductionist assumptions. And in the past, people like this that I've met have just been quite dismissive of psychedelic experience and just never, never had the experience and sort of written it off as you know, just random brain activity or something in, in a way which I found was really quite disappointing and, and dismissive. But more recently, there's, there's been this emergence of, um, among other things, the Qualia Research Institute typifies this sort of new interest in psychedelics among these hyper-rational reductionists involved in the uh, technology world. Um, and uh, this, this sort of crosses over with the Silicon Valley sort of microdosing scene, that, that kind of thing. They're, they're starting to take an interest in in psychedelics, and they're trying to, as it says here, discover the mathematical structure of consciousness, which immediately makes me suspicious. My background's in mathematics, my primary interest is in consciousness, and I don't, I, don't, I think this is doomed to fail, but um, they're trying. This is, this is their mission statement. So they're trying to develop a precise mathematical language for describing subjective experience, to understand the nature of emotional valence, 
to map out the full space of possible conscious experiences. So, of course, that has to include all of the psychedelic and mystical experiences. And also, perhaps worryingly, to build technologies to radically improve people's lives. I mean, that sounds good in theory, but um, if you understand the way these people think, that, that could, could be slightly worrying. Um, for example, I mean, this is some of their research work. Um, there's, there's a paper called Quantifying Bliss. I mean, just the title makes me somewhat alarmed. Um, I, won't, I could open it up and we can scroll through it, but I'm going to try and keep this a bit um, condensed. Quantified, so they, they, they've decided that, uh, not decided, but they're sort of suggesting that um, bliss could perhaps be quantified in terms of certain symmetries, certain mathematical symmetries, evident in the brain when mapped into certain mathematical spaces. Um, but then, you know, they are exploring, you know, these people are trying 5-MeO-DMT and so on, and then trying to capture the experience in some kind of mathematical framework. Oh, uh, yes, good point. Okay. Um, so the, rather than approaching psychedelics from the point of view of how can I challenge my existing worldviews, uh, which is sort of how I experience, I've approached the experience, um, they, they're sort of approaching this new and exotic body of experiences or modes of consciousness and trying to capture them within an existing framework, um, which is this idea that everything can be modeled mathematically, even bliss can be quantified. Um, but this is this third one's curious. They're, they're trying to replicate psychedelic visuals using computer graphics. Um, the reasoning for it's rather convoluted. I won't get into that. Um, but it's this part. Of, there, there is a, a scene online of um, what gets called replication. I don't know if you've come across this. Is a Reddit group called R slash Replication, and it's it's psychonauts making. Um, making visuals using computer graphics to try and replicate psychedelic visual experience. Um, and it's, you know, there's some fairly cheap tricks going on here, just some simple optical algorithms that are uh, creating a fairly convincing, of, uh, you know, uh, replication of perhaps what you might see under a certain dose of certain psychedelics. Um, and so this is using computer technology to try and perhaps... Um, get some well, insight, I don't know if insight's the word, but trying to capture mathematically in some sense the, the internal experience of psychedelics. There's another one coming up here. They've added a few more features, so you'll, you might see some uh, other things coming out, out of the screen at you. But um, it's, I suppose the visual aspect of psychedelics is one that you can actually try to work with. It would be hard to replicate the, if you think about the, 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 the non-visual aspects, um, where would you even begin? Whereas here, you can you can start with an image and then you can run some code on it to, to produce a set of filters and uh, evolving filters to create these sorts of effects, which look, you know, pretty convincing if you're familiar with the states. The eyes there are, have been sort of, there's some sort of additional codes to introduce the eyes. And then there's another one I could show you where it gets, oh, I might as well. It gets a bit more, um, you know, there's a few more things going on there, but, you know, it's... Uh, if you look at these on the Reddit group, followed by lots of comments from people going, yeah, man, I'm, you know, I, I, this is totally what it looks like. You know, people who are uh, sort of concurring that, that, that this is a genuine replication of some sort. But the Qualia, Replic the Qualia Research Institute are interested in replication for, um, you know, be re reasons beyond the recreational, shall we say. Now, um, this goes back, this kind of replication thing goes back at least to 2015 when Google, um, Google introduced this uh, software called Deep Dream, which you might have messed with. It's basically upload an image and it puts it through a filter. This is um, Van Gogh's Starry Night put through the Deep Dream filter. And it was a spin-off from some image recognition software. It was basically software which was designed to be able to look at images and photographs and, and classify them according to what, what, what their content was. Um, you could basically mess with the parameters and get them to over-interpret images and see things which weren't there. And so um, there's a couple of renderings of the Mona Lisa. A lot of people wonder immediately why there's all these sort of dogs everywhere. And also lots of eyes, lots of dogs, lots of beaks. Um, I'll explain later why that's the case. Um, there's a bit of uh, classic bit of deep dream art with camper vans and pagodas and slug puppies. And <laughs> um, so now when, when I first saw this stuff in 2015, I felt slightly alarmed or sort of, I felt like that one of the last preserves of the unquantifiable aspects of experience had been colonized by technology. Um, 
it was like, wait a minute, a computer shouldn't be able to see that or show that. That that should be something private. It was a sort of sense of almost violation, um, which strangely wore off very quickly. It just after a while, it's just a sort of cheap parlor trick. Um, so there's uh, Obama, with lots of eyes, our future king, looking good. And um, now this, there's an earlier instance of computer technology, computer graphics crossing over with psychedelic experience. Um, when fractals like the Mandelbrot set, which had sort of first started to appear in the early 80s because computers were fast enough and printers were high resolution enough to, to render them, um, psychedelic enthusiasts would see these images, and I experienced this directly, showing pictures like this to people who'd, you know, who'd done quite a lot of mushrooms or LSD. And... And they say, oh, yeah, I've seen stuff like that before. You know, I recognize that. It, 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 was, it was the closest thing they'd seen in the outside world to mirror what they'd experienced with their internal psychedelic visuals. Now, at the time, there wasn't this feeling of something being wrong about the computer technology sort of colonizing our psychedelic space. At the time, there was this real sense of optimism, and um, computers and the internet held this amazing promise in the early 90s, and particularly the psychedelic community. It really embraced it, and it seemed like it was going to be this new psychedelic frontier. I mean, Timothy Leary had been pushing this kind of idea in the 70s. Um, and so this is from a, a 2013 rave, which is a sort of retro, looking back at 20 years. So fractals all over the place. People love the fractals um, So it's slightly open. <laughs> Terrible sound systems and everything from the early 90s. So it's kind of a, it's a sort of a slightly mocking, sort of affectionate look back to the early 90s and this obsession with fractals. Um, so that was kind of a lot again, sorry. Um, Please. There we go. So now the fractals have stayed in, in the uh, psychedelic music and uh, dance world. The, the side trance scene, you'll see people wearing, you know, Mandelbrot gear. It's it's probably the, the um, primary crossover between computer technology and psychedelics, uh, maybe alongside the, the Silicon Valley enthusiasm for microdosing. This is where these things meet. Um, but I want to talk about another um, unexpected crossover of computer graphics and um, computer technology with psychedelics. And this involves um, pareidolia, specifically facial pareidolia. Now, these are just pictures from silly uh, Facebook groups and, and Twitter accounts of you know, things that look like they have faces in them, which you know, is all a bit childish. But just have a quick look at these and imagine what kind of characters they would be. Imagine what their voices would be like, what kind of personalities they would have if they were characters, say, in a children's book. And look at the differences between these two types of American electrical outlets. Um, they clearly have different facial expressions, and they create a kind of an emotional reaction in us, even if we think that's silly. Um, so pareidolia, uh, in, in general, is when you, it's the tendency for perception to impose a meaningful interpretation on a nebulous stimulus, usually visual, so that you see an object pattern or meaning where there is none. So you could have auditory pareidolia, where you hear, not, hear voices in, in static, for example. It's hard to imagine what um, olfactory or taste-based pareidolia would be like. I don't know if such things could exist. Um, but I'm just going to show you, I'm just going to scroll through some more of these silly pictures and just, just try and feel the character that you're looking at and what sort of emotional content is being conveyed to you by effectively just, you know, an inanimate objects. Um, they create a sort of, we, we could all sort of concur to some extent on what sort of personalities these things would have. So what's going on in our brains when we look at a cardboard box and we actually think we're seeing, we can't help but feel there's a face there. Um, now, uh, admit, yes. Um, so I think this one's my favorite. I mean, there's just so much pathos in that rusty bit of metal. Like it looks, you could imagine that character. It's, it's, it speaks to you at some level. Um, and obviously plenty of opportunities for humor with this sort of thing. Um, but it, all a bit silly, but there's an, there is a serious side to this. Um, here's the man who introduced the word into the language, well, into ger the German language. He introduced uh, pareidolie. Um, and he was classifying mental illnesses at the time. We won't worry too much about him. Uh, so it's, the, the, the consensus seems to be that we are able to see faces in things uh, which aren't there. We, we, we have this tendency to do so because we've, we have a highly developed um, sort of uh, 
mechanism in the brain for facial recognition for survival reasons. It's really important to be able to see when there's somebody coming and then also read their facial expression and determine what their emotional state is if they re represent a threat or whatever. Um, and it's, it seems that the image recognition part of the brain has a specialized sub-component or module, I wouldn't know what the correct terminology would be, but the fusiform face area um, has been shown if you put a brain under fMRI scan um, and you show somebody pictures of faces, this area lights up, whereas if you show them inanimate objects or whatever, it doesn't. Uh, more recently, Doris Sow um, has been doing work on monkey brains. It seems this is probably mirrored in the human brain, but there are these other little areas, these little patches of neurons, which tend to light up when, when um, faces are presented. And not only that, it seems you can read off the electrical activity from these different neural pa um, little patches of neurons and reconstruct the face that is being seen. In other words, you could show a monkey a face without you seeing that face, read the data off the neurons, run it into a program which then constructs a face from a template, and that face would match the face being seen. So the neuroscience of face facial recognition is, is coming along. Um, but pareidolia is another matter. Now, obviously, we're here. Um, this is, we're interested in, in the psychedelic experience here. Um, and I'm interested in where facial pareidolia crosses over with the psychedelic experience. And so it's important to make um, a distinction between a kind of shared or public pareidolia and the, and the private experience of it. Um, so the, the silly pictures I showed you of the cardboard boxes and that kind of thing, we can all see them. We can all point at them and go, oh, yeah, there's the eyes, there's the mouth, ha, ha, ha. Oh, that one looks happy or that one looks annoyed or whatever. Um, if you take psychedelics and go and sit in the woods and you start seeing faces coming out of, of, the, of the undergrowth at you, um, that's, that's a private experience. If you took a photograph and then looked at it later or showed it to someone, chances are they wouldn't see those faces or even the person sitting next to you, unless perhaps you were really tuned into each other. There's no point trying to point this out. This is something internal. So it's impossible to show you a picture of private pareidolia simply because it is internal. But this, despite being a little bit cheesy, this is the best thing I could find, which edges from the shared pareidolia into, the, gives a sense of what private pareidolia would, would be like. Um, and uh, so the question is, why is it with psychedelics that people have um, increased pareidolia? Why is it we're more likely to see faces coming out of us in that state? I thought when I looked, I'd find a body of research, you know, people looking into, you know, psilocybin and facial pareidolia. There's almost nothing out there, I think, because it's just very hard to study because you can't, you never really know when it's going to happen. Um, there's no obvious way to make it happen, except in this one particular instance, there was a, uh, someone who'd taken too much LSD and was having persistent pareidolia, even after they'd stopped taking it, they would see faces in, specifically in trees. So this research group were able to monitor the person's fusiform face area and then show them faces and show them trees. And when they said, yes, I can see faces in those trees, they, would, they were interested in the difference in the uh, neural activation. And it seems there is a difference. So um, these findings indicate key differences in how hallucinatory, in other words, paradolic and veridical actual perceptions lead to the same phenomenological experience of seeing faces. So whether this person's looking at a photograph of an actual face or a tree and seeing a face, they're having the phenomenological experience of a face, but there seems to be something going on, some difference in what's going on uh, neurologically. Um, but that's really all the research I could find in terms of psychedelics and pareidolia. So there's, there's work to be done there, perhaps. Now, this is very recent and interesting to me. Like April 2022, um, two, two cognitive scientists in Montreal um, they're interested in measuring creativity or, or studying creativity. Um, there's lots of different definitions, I imagine, within psychology of how you, uh, what, site, what creativity is and how you measure it, different, different metrics available. Um, they, they opted for one of those, gathered a group of volunteers across the spectrum of creativity, so from the very creative to the not very creative. Um, no psychedelics involved. They just showed them random noisy imagery and got them to try and see things in it, and to put it very simply. And as you might guess, the more, crea the more creative people, the ones that had been predetermined as more creative, saw more stuff, and the less creative people saw less stuff. So this is interesting because creativity, 
according to their measure of creativity, leads to increased paratonia. Psychedelics, putting creativity to one side, if you just give someone psychedelics, according to all the trip reports, and well, to, according to quite a lot of anecdotal evidence of trip reports, psychedelics lead to increased paratonia. So what's, where does creativity fit into that? What even is creativity? I don't know. It's just a possible research direction someone might want to look into. Um, now, this is, a, this is another attempt to kind of going from the public or shared pareidolia into the private, in the sense you can see the eyes and the mouth, but it, this, there's something about that photograph which just sort of captures this, you know, it's almost like only I can see that. It, it, that reminds me of psychedelic pareidolia. Um, and it brings me to a, an anecdotal account of my own. Um, I had a, the first time I went camping on my own in the woods when I was in my early twenties, um, and I was quite nervous about being on my own in the woods, but it was just like, Thing I had to put myself through, kind of almost a sort of an initiatory experience. But I was completely sober. I didn't have any intoxicants or psychedelics or anything. And uh, at one point, I was looking at my knees, and the the um, fabric in my trousers were sort of um, was slightly crinkled. And I suddenly saw a pair of eyes looking at me, and not like, oh, that looks a bit like a pair of eyes, but more like, whoa, something coming out of this pattern of light and shade, something very subtle and something I knew no one else would be able to see if they happened to be looking. Um, and it was quite alarming. I was like, oh no, what's going on? And, I, and then over the course of that weekend, I saw a lot of stuff coming out of the woods at me. And I started to worry, am I, am I going, you know, is this, is this the beginning of some kind of madness? Um, and in the end, I just decided to just go with it and just accept it. So what was going on there? It wasn't psychedelics enhancing or um, increasing the, the, the um, amount of pareidolia. It was, perhaps it was being on edge. It was maybe a survival instinct. It was tuning my, you know, we've evolved this ability to see faces for survival reasons. Maybe if you're somewhere where you're worried about your survival, it's just heightened to the point you start seeing faces. You get, you get false positives. You see faces that aren't there. Maybe it was that. There might be something else. Um, which I'm, this is where I start to become a bit vague and speculative, but bear with me. So I had a friend some years later who, um, she wanted to try psilocybin and asked me if I'd accompany her and make sure she was all right. So I took her to um, this beautiful spot on Dartmoor, uh, you know, mossy rocks and, and lichen and ferns and gnarled old oak trees and that kind of thing. It's, it's, it's so exactly the sort of place that you, a romantic poet might um, have referred to as an elf haunted glade. Uh, sort of place you might expect to find kind of nature spirits if you're that way inclined. Um, I remain agnostic and open to all possibilities. But um, at one point, my friend who was, you know, she'd come up, she was, she was at about the right level, I felt, everything was going well. And she was just paddling in the stream and she was looking at the roots growing out of the, um, the, the stream bank into the water. And she said, Matthew, is it, is it supposed to look like this? I was like, oh no, is something going wrong? And I said, well, what's, what's the matter? What are you seeing? And she said, well, you know, th these faces everywhere. And I was like, oh, oh yeah, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that's normal. Yeah, yeah that's, that's just what happens. Don't worry about it. Um, and then that got me thinking, what, what is that? And what I came up with at the time, and I was, you know, I was perhaps a less rigorous thinker back then, but it's, it's, it's an idea worth considering, is that if there are some kind of disembodied or demonic intelligences or entities which do inhabit or somehow anchor themselves to specific locations in the world. Now, there's lots of traditions around the world of such entities. Whatever you make of them, let's just entertain the possibility there might be such entities in the world. Um, it's possible my friend had opened herself up to those entities. They were making themselves known to her, but because they're not physical beings, her mind had to clothe these presences with some sort of form. And it, it reminded me of uh, what Terence McKenna, who I have a lot of time for, despite thinking he's a charlatan, his writings on alien abductions in the 1990s, or you know, accounts of supposed alien abductions. He had this idea that when people thought they were being abducted by aliens, they were actually having self-generated DMT experiences uh, brought on by some heightened anxiety or something. And then they were encountering entities. And those entities don't have a physical form but people clothe them with the visual expectation of what they should look like. So someone in the Middle Ages would have thought they were being abducted by fairies and taken into the underworld, whereas somebody in 1992 would think they were being abducted by grey aliens from Zeti Reticula and taken into a spacecraft, and that's what you end up seeing. So 
Now, I don't know what my friend saw, what, I don't know what the faces looked like because it was her own private pareidolia, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was in the sort of general aesthetic world of, of what Brian Froud was doing. And interestingly, he's an artist who lives on Dartmoor. Um, he moved to Chagford in 1975, and then three years later, he co-authored this book called Fairies, which is kind of like a field guide to the little people. And it's very, you know, if you just read it, it's just fun, just fiction, just, just you know, art, just entertainment. It's amazing. I mean, the, the, the imagery is incredible. Um, that, there's some, some more of his images. But it was very popular, particularly with the psychedelic counterculture. And I think this is because it kind of looks like what psychedelic pareidolia looks like. That's just my take on it. And interestingly, even though it was widely praised, it was criticized for not clearly separating fact from fiction. It's kind of playfully written like it's an actual field guide to actual entities. But I think that's kind of the point because these demonic entities, if there are such things, daemonic, uh, D-A-E, in case you didn't catch that, um, they exist somewhere, they do exist. They exist somewhere on the border of actual physical reality and the mundus imaginalis or the collective unconscious or the psychoid or whatever you call it. And it's like Brian Froud and Alan Lee, who wrote this book, were kind of playing with that. And it's almost like he's got a little bit of a, Brian Froud is able to bring the private pareidolia into the public domain. Um, now, Rorschach, the Rorschach test is obviously relevant because this is a way of taking a random noise, effectively, an ink blot, and projecting the, the content, the interior content of somebody's mind. So it has some psychotherapeutic uses. So that could suggest that if I'm seeing elves or demons in the woods, that really what I'm seeing are parts of my own psyche manifesting. Um, now, simulacra, just a quick mention of, um, this is something which you find around the world that certain mountains or mountain ranges or rock faces will be known as, you know, the old man of whatever, um, because it looks a bit like a face. And this is again, this is shared pareidolia where the whole tribe goes and looks and sees the face. Now, this is my favourite one. Um, I don't know if you know about this, Peter. Down um, just west of Land's End, Dr. Syntax's Head. Um, it's the weirdest place name in the British Isles. It's, and it's the westernmost point. It's further west than Land's End, and nobody's heard of it. And when I first saw this on a map, when I was down in Cornwall one October, um, in the appropriate state of mind, I thought it was a joke. I thought some cartographer had sneaked the name Dr. Syntax's Head onto the map. Turns out it's this thing, and the reason it's called that is because of this character who was popular in some books in the early 19th century, which have since been completely forgotten. Um, but everyone knew Dr. Syntax, and uh, he was a retired school teacher who went on, on adventures and got himself into trouble, and was, it was this beautifully illustrated series of books. Um, and some people, someone looked at that and thought, ah, oh, that looks like Dr. Syntax's head. And he was a known character. It would be a bit like Bart Simpson or something. If, if you, you had a rock that looked a bit like Bart Simpson's head, everyone would see it, and you might end up with the name on a map decades later. Um, I don't know what was up with Giuseppe Archimboldo. Um, this is the jurist whose face is made of uh, fish and poultry, and uh, this is a Roman emperor done up as fruit and veg. Um, I don't know if there was ergot involved in that or what, what the idea was, but um, that's more public weird pareidolia. Now, Da Vinci, this, this brings us back to the creativity thing, because I think whatever metric of, you use for creativity, I think Leonardo would have been off the charts. And he, there's this quote from his notebooks where he basically says, if you, if you stare at a splotchy wall long enough, you start to see fantastical scenes and armies and rocks and trees and hills and villages. And you, all, all you have to do is just kind of go with it and you can create endless an infinite number of things that can be reduced into separate and well-conceived forms. So what he's talking about is moving content from private pareidolia into public space. Now, apparently he, he used lots of pareidolia in his art. I couldn't find any examples better than this one, which somebody, you know, it's a bit debatable. Is that a face or not? It's a bit of his, one of his pieces turned sideways. I don't know, but he was definitely interested in the subject. Um, obviously Dali and the Surrealists were, they're working with the, you know, the contents of the unconscious. And, um, Again, I should say Dali, Da Vinci, and, and Brian Froud had in common that they were sort of taking this private experience and sort of hinting at it in a way. It's like, yeah, we can look at that and see a face, but it's also kind of feels like one of those faces you might see in an altered state that no one else would see. Um, then moving into the digital age, the, the emoticons before they before emojis, we have these. I still use them. And it's amazing how much expression is in these things, considering they're just a few pixels. Um, you know, and it's uh, 
there's, I found this quote, I've lost the source, but it says cognitive processes are activated by the face-like object, which alerts the observer to both the emotional state and identity of the subject, even before the conscious mind begins to process or even receive the information. So you look at that, and before you go, oh, there's a colon and a right parenthesis, what's that? Oh, it's, I suppose it's a face if you turn to, it's like, you know, I look at that, I feel the concern of the concerns, you know, it's just some typography, but it, it, it expresses a surprising amount. Um, so we are very well tuned to this, and uh, there's, there was a huge proliferation of emoticons I never even knew about. There's a Wikipedia page about them. There was another set of entirely different ones used in East Asia, um, which were more focused on the eyes, apparently, because there's greater uh, emotional communication goes on, or is read uh, in the eyes. There's, there are differences in the way faces are read, apparently, in, in different uh, parts of the world. So here's an example, just a really simple figure, just a circle and three horizontal lines. And yet you look at that and you can, you see a face, you can't help it. And you can also get a sense of maybe it's a bit smug, maybe it's a bit weary. You know, different people are going to read different things into it, but you will find some consensus, uh, like with the cardboard boxes and suitcases and rusty hinges. Now, this is an amusing title from a Chinese research group, Seeing Jesus in Toast. Now, this runs somewhat contrary to the, the research group from Montreal because well, this group gave people random noise again to look at, but they lied to them and said that 50% of the images you're going to be shown have got either faces or letters hidden in them. And so people, not surprisingly, did think they were seeing letters or faces about a third of the time. And what they found was um, the faces triggered the, um, the, uh, the fusiform area, but the, the letters didn't. I seem to remember that was their conclusion which kind of runs contrary. So it seems that the fusiform area can be triggered by faces which aren't, aren't there. But what interested me about this paper is they, um, yeah, uh, sensory input with even the slightest suggestion of a face can result in the interpretation of a face. Uh, and then there's the religious dimension to this. Um, Jesus in total, why is it always Jesus? It's just, a, it could be like um, a bass player in a country rock band from the 70s. But uh, that doesn't look like the Virgin Mary to me, but. Someone got 28 grand for it. A cheese toasty that never went moldy, apparently. I think because it was encased in epoxy resin. Um, but there is a serious art, and of course, the um, cinnamon bun found in Nashville that looked like Mother Teresa. Now, I doubt there was much religious or, or devotion. I think someone probably just saw that and thought it was funny. But there's a whole thing online of people finding Jesus in their food, pizzas with Jesus in, crisps with Jesus in. Um, it's a whole other area. And it, it seems that people who are religiously inclined, that, that's another way that pareidolia can be heightened. So psychedelics can cause increased pareidolia. Creativity can cause increased pareidolia, but also a sense of religious expectation or awe. So this experiment involved giving people a um, piece of cloth. Uh, one group were told it was just a piece of cloth. One group were told it was a religious relic. And the other group were told it was a religious relic and it was believed that certain inscriptions could be seen in it by some people. And not surprisingly, people who thought they were just looking at a bit of cloth didn't really generally see much. People who thought it was a, an, um, a religious uh, relic saw some uh, pareidolic religious inscriptions. And then the people who'd been given cues saw those cues. So this makes me wonder if um, camping in the woods and my friend did, did this place in Merivale uh, in, uh, on Dartmoor, um, then it was, there was a sense of awe. We were in this... Like, it was like going into a cathedral, you know, going into the woods can be like in the right place if, you know, the conditions are right. It can have the same effect on you as going into an amazing, you know, gothic cathedral or something, which creates this heightened sense of sort of religious expectation or something. I don't really have a name for it, but you're sort of primed maybe to have more pareidolia. So that would be a more interesting, uh, less um, prosaic explanation uh, rather than just this sort of heightened survival thing. Now, we now move into the, the designed and built world. Now, I remember looking at cars when I was a child um, on long journeys, looking at the oncoming cars with my sister, and we'd see faces in them, and we'd talk about the different faces and which ones we liked and their different expressions. And, you know, you grow out of these things, and it just seems like some silly childhood thing. But then I remember in the 90s starting to notice the cars just kind of started to look really mean. Um, certain cars just look really nasty. And I thought, is this intentional? Because I seem to remember cars that are quite cheerful and optimistic when I was a kid. And it turns out, no, this is, this is a real thing. The designers know about this stuff. This is from the Wall Street Journal. Um, 
Associations of frontal views of cars with emotions or character are claimed to influence sales volumes. And people like the angry looking ones because driving is stressful and you need to like, you know, you need to project a kind of angry, a dominant sort of image or um, attitude out into the traffic. Otherwise, you know, you, you don't stand a chance. So even timid people are going to buy these mean looking. I was out in the States just recently and there's this whole new um, style of pickup trucks big chunky things really high off the ground really intimidating looking with these really nasty looking fronts and uh somebody designed them for that reason and then it, going the opposite direction of course you've got children children's literature is full of anthropomorphized machinery but that's just a, that's another matter i won't get into that um architecture so someone else had the same idea with architecture what happens when you take a building and you run facial recognition software on it so there's software which can look at pictures of people's faces and determine their emotional states. It's quite useful for market research or whatever. Um, you measure the distances between various key points on the face, you know, corners of the mouth and eyebrows and things. And you can basically train up a, a, an algorithm to, to more or less accurately read facial expressions. Now someone had the idea of running that on buildings. Now, what kind of expression does this building have? Now, it, it may be you never look at that building and see a face but it, it does affect you because it's a slightly intimidating or angry or troubled looking building. And so they're suggesting we could use this in the future to design buildings which make people feel good. So all this points to a future full of really, really happy looking shop fronts and angry looking vehicles. Um, but it's all coming from this paradolic experience, even though most of people wouldn't be aware that's what's going on. So facial recognition software, once it's figured out where the face is, once it's found a face, um, it identifies a couple of dozen key points on the face and then creates these line segments between them and measures them. And th those measurements, the lengths of all of the different line segments in this kind of strange mesh, are what are used to determine the emotional character of that face. Um, and someone had this idea of running that kind of software on one of these silly um, online groups. It's a Flickr group called Hello Little Fella, full of silly pictures of things that look like they've got faces in them for people who've got nothing better to do. And so they applied, this person applied this algorithm called S3FD to these photos to see, does it see the faces as well? And it turns out of 627 faces, 681 images, sorry, it was shown, it only found a face in 7% of them. So when I scrolled through all of those silly pictures of cardboard boxes and rusty hinges and whatever, this, this program would be looking at it going, I don't see a face, I don't see a face, I don't see a Occasionally, one in 12, it would actually see a face. Now, some of them, it would see the same face as us. It would get the eyes and the mouth right. There are others where that's, this, these, it got right as well. You can't really see the faces because of the mesh, but there's a you know, face in a biscuit, face in an electrical socket. Some of them it gets wrong or partially wrong. So it sees the eyes, it's got the eyes right here, but it thought the mouth was down there, as we all know, this is the mouth. Similarly, it got the eyes totally wrong here because it's looking for a human type face. It's been trained on human type faces. And I think the difference is that we've been, our, con our concept of a face includes human faces, but also includes all the animal faces, all the cartoon faces, all the silly sort of, you know, um, animated characters and advertising logos and anthropomorphized things that we encounter in the media world. So we see, oh yeah, happy looking metal thing with big round eyes. It's trying to see an actual human face there and it's partially succeeding. Um, and the, uh, the experimenter says, when these kinds of near agreements occur, I find myself going through a series of emotions, excitement, it sees it, let down, oh, but that's not quite it. Empathy, you were so close, just a little to the left. I see where you went wrong. Then there's the ones where it totally misses it. So look, we see a face here with a like aquiline nose and a stiff upper lip and a flat cap. It's totally failed to see that face, probably because it doesn't really look like a human face. It's seen a face somewhere in the undergrowth or in the handle or something. Um, likewise, obviously we see an eyes of the mouth. That doesn't really look like a face. It's seeing a face in the wood grain. That, that if you take that mesh away, you wouldn't see it. Likewise, this, you know, no one's face looks like that, but yet we see a face and it doesn't, it sees it there. So the, the, the AI is having its own experience of pareidolia and the experimenter wrote, the more of these that I saw, the more the effect started to feel truly other, like a coherent but alien idea of what faces were. It made me wonder what I was missing. What is it seeing there? 
It's a feeling akin to having a conversation with someone who's gradually losing interest in what you're saying and starting to scan the room over your shoulder. So what we're looking at now is algorithms which are kind of having their own private pareidolia. They're, they're seeing the face, but they can't show it to you because you, you won't be able to see it. Um, and to give some sense of maybe what this would look like, just to edge into something which is publicly visible, or shared pareidolia, this um, couple of Dutch artists did a piece called Paradolia in 2019, where they put millions of grains of sand through a microscope in, with some automatic uh, automated machinery, and it then scanned the microscopic image of the sand grain from various angles and, to, and looked for faces. If it saw a face, it kept the sand grain. If it didn't, it rejected it. And they ended up with the top 100 faces. Here's eight of them. And now these, these are nothing like the cardboard boxes and things. These, these, are, these look, and they're also they're not really like faces. They're, they're more like the kinds of psychedelic, visual, sort of hypnagogic, feverish, uh, distorted faces you might see in, in your interior visual sense. But these are being recognized by facial recognition software. And if you were to change the parameters ever so slightly, you'd just be looking at a grain of sand going, I don't see the face. So this, is, this looks to me like the borderline of computer pareidolia. Now, I'm going to speak about um, neural networks. I was planning to go into a bit more detail, but I think it would just go on for too long. So I'll try not to be, um, I mean, I'll try to make sense. Um, obviously, I can't explain artificial intelligence in 15 minutes, but um, within this, the AI scene, the, the, the primary algorithms people are concerned with at the moment are what are called neural networks, artificial neural networks there kind of abstractions of parts of the brain um, in the sense that you have what are effectively neurons joined by synapses. And the neurons fire, in this case, from left to right along these synapses. And a neuron that receives enough signals from other neurons as a significantly, um, at once the, the signals, the total signal received from the previous layer reaches a certain threshold, it will fire and it's connected to all the neurons in the next layer and so on. So you have an input layer, which would correspond to say, your sensory, sensory input. So like the, the nerve cells at the back of your retina, for example, would be sensory input. The light in the room causes certain neurons in my retina to fire and certain not to fire. Um, and then there's a whole chain of, of layers of neurons linked by synapses. And the output layer would be possibly some internal interpretation of what I'm seeing, or it might be a motor reaction, like if something was coming at me, I might move. Um, but effectively, you have a, an entirely mechanistic um, setup here. Um, and it's, it's basically governed by what are called the weights. Each of these synapses, each of these line segments joining a pair of neurons has a number associated with it, it, associated with it called its weight which is effectively how important it is, how weighty it is, in the sense that if you have a, a number of neurons firing along their synapses to this neuron, the ones with weightier synapses will have like a sort of bigger influence. Like it's, they're all voting on whether that should fire or not, and some of them have bigger votes than others. Um, now, if you change the weights of a neural network, you change the results of what happens. If you feed some input in, you get different output if the weights change. And this is the basis for... Um, training a neural network, where this is the, base, the basis of most of what's called machine learning. So, for example, you can train a neural network to recognize handwritten digits. This is a, a classic example. It's a very simple application. It's useful for post offices and things. <coughs> Trying to write some computer code to get um, uh, um, to take. Uh, a graphic of a handwritten digit and decide whether it's a zero, one, two, three, or, or you know, whatever. Um, to actually do that as a series of instructions is incredibly difficult. To actually try and describe what a three or a four looks like in all its generality, in all the different ways that someone may need to necessarily write a three, it's kind of beyond our capabilities to do that. But you can take one of these and you can train it to do that. And you do it by basically you break your handwritten digit down into a 28 by 28 grid in this case. So you've got a, a, a mosaic of 784 tiles. Each one is either black, white, or some shade of gray. You change that into numerical data. So say black is zero, white is one, and gray is zero in between. You have an input layer with 784 neurons. So like we're looking at something like this, but just much, much bigger. More layers, more neurons per layer. 784 of, of those, not eight. Um, and then we have 10 output um, neurons at the end. 
So we feed the digit in. We start off with just a bunch of random weights. We, we, we weight our synapses randomly to start with. We feed our digit in as a series of, of, uh, of numerical values, and we get some output in our 10 output neurons, which give us the probability that the uh, digit is a zero, the probability it's a one, the probability it's a two, and so on. And then we, we take the one with the highest probability and interpret that as, okay, it's telling us it's probably a six, but it might be a five, and there's a very small chance it might be a two, or something like that. Now, it starts off, it's completely random. It's, it might as well be guessing, but you can take its, its success and its, or its failure, and you can feed that back mathematically through the system through a thing, we're using a, a, a mechanism called back propagation, which basically tweaks the weights of the synapses layer by layer to make it more likely to get it right next time. And you just run millions and millions of examples through, and then you run this feedback based on whether it's successful or the, the extent to which it's successful or failing. And after enough examples, it can recognize handwritten digits better than you can ones it's never seen before. I mean, you know, you can just, anyone can write any digits and it recognizes them with incredible accuracy and we don't know how it does that. And this is sort of exciting because it's like a, a, having a child that grows up to be a prodigy in mathematics or something. You're like, how, is, how does it do it? You know, the parents have no input and yet it's able to do these amazing things. So the people who've devised these algorithms are usually initially quite amazed and slightly spooked, but sort of proud of the fact this creation of theirs is able to do something. We don't really know how it's doing it. But more recently, it's become um, a bit worrying because if these things get too big, they can start to do things that, that we didn't necessarily want them to do. Um, and this is the basis of AI alignment safety research. Um, that We're looking to the long-term future where some of these networks get so huge, they can start delegating and creating subsystems within inside themselves, which start to go uh, sort of astray from the original purpose of what you were cre creating the algorithm for. Um, take quite a while to explain that in, in any detail, but we're basically interested in at this stage, before things get too big, let's try and figure out what's going on inside this thing. It's like a black box. We need to like understand a bit better how it's doing what it's doing before it starts doing things that we don't want it to do. Um, now, Google Deep Dream uses neural networks. This is, uh, you can tell who that is. Lots of dogs again. The reason that all the dogs keep showing up is because um, the, the image recognition software that Google Deep Dream is based on, it's basically, a, it's, a, it's a sort of recreational spin-off of some serious software. The serious software, you show it a picture of Donald Trump and it, it says, yes, that's a picture of Donald Trump standing in front of an American flag. But it turns out you can, tweak the parameters of this software and get it to sort of over-interpret and start to see things that aren't there. And then just slightly adjust it to make them look like they're slightly more there than they were and then run it back through the system until eventually you get dogs growing out of Donald Trump's face. But why is it just dogs and eyes and beaks and things? It's because the original software, the, the original um, data set that the software was trained on um, was a subset of what's called ImageNet. ImageNet's the kind of gold standard, uni um, industry standard, image set, which is used for testing vision, visual sort of uh, image recognition type algorithms. So it's a millions of hand-labeled photographs of different things. So there's a thousand categories. So there'll be like thousands of, of different photos of scuba divers and thousands of photographs of <laughs> water bottles and thousands of photographs of clouds and things like this. And they're all labeled. And you can train your networks on these image, on this image net database. But for some reason, they trained this one on a subset of it, which was specifically different breeds, hundreds of different breeds of dog. So it's basically seeing dogs everywhere, because that's that's what it's been trained to see. Um, now, this is the first one I saw. It's also eyes, lots of eyes. Um, that's the first Google Deep Dream image I saw, a piece of toast. And it, that was really alarming. I thought, that shouldn't be possible. I don't like the fact that computers can do this. Um, but I've since, like I said, it, it kind of, you get used to it. Um, now, you may have come across this one, Wombo. This is using an artificial um, neural network to create images from captions. And this is where we start to get some really psychedelic, psychedelic art, whatever that means. Um, and the way this one works is somebody trained a network to match images with captions. So, for example, you give it 100 different photos. One of them is a picture of three children playing Frisbee and you give it the caption, three children playing Frisbee, and it's supposed to find the picture that matches the caption. You, it doesn't know what a child is, it doesn't know what a Frisbee is, it doesn't know anything, but you show enough of these images with captions, you train it for long enough, it can recognize 
all kinds of stuff. It can caption images really well. And you can basically reverse this, give it a caption, and it will start with a soup of pixels, just some random noise, visual noise, and it will start tweaking it until it starts to look a little bit like the caption that you've given it. It's like evaluating how much does this look like Margaret Thatcher Ziggurat. These were created by some of my friends who set up a Facebook group. It lasted about a week and then everyone got bored with it. So that's Keanu Reeves drops acid for the first time. Elon Musk, Ayahuasca Shaman. Boris Johnson is a Pokemon. Disco Last Supper. Foucault drawn by H.R. Geiger. Colonel Sanders has an existential crisis. Prince Philip smokes DMT. Easter Bunny crucifixion. That's Chagford where I live. That is really like Chagford on mushrooms. Borg Kardashians. Terence McKenna bathes in baked beans. Um, Bart Simpson on trial for war crimes. Winnie the Pooh Aztec sacrifice. I mean, Osama Bin Laden on the jar of on a ladle of jar of peanut butter. That was going to be my Christmas card. Cozy Christmas with Cthulhu. Um, hell, who, souvenir hoodie. So this thing's basically looked at loads of captioned pictures, and then you give it a caption, and it creates his image. And it's again. It, to the psychedelically experience. This is alarming at first and then amazing. And then after a while, it's just kind of normal. Kentucky Fried Human, uh, the second weirdest thing ever. That's one of mine. I won't show you the weirdest thing ever. You wouldn't be able to handle it. Um, uh, no, that, I mean, that's a cubist sphere. That's amazing. I thought if a cubist had painted that in, back in the day, that would have you know, been a great work of art. And yet it's just some just random things spat out by an app for a laugh. Jimi Hendrix in a Hall of Mirrors, and God, that's, God is a Lego figure on MDMA. <laughs> <laughs> so now this is, so various other people are starting to pick up on this Paradolia AI crossover and, and use it creatively. This is a German uh, blogger who took a photo of a cup of coffee with a, obviously a very strong shadow, ran it through a basic Photoshop filter to make it into that, and then ran StyleGAN on it. StyleGAN creates pictures of people that don't exist. This is not a real woman. No one looks like that. Or there's probably people who look a bit like that. But um, StyleGAN is a generative adversarial network, very interesting type of AI algorithm. It's two, two algorithms working against each other, a, a generator and a discriminator. The generator is playing the role of like a, an art forger, like someone trying to create fake pictures of people. And the discriminator is like the forensic detective trying to pit spot the fakes. And they're both training to do that against each other. So they both up their game all the time. The forger gets better at forging. The forger scores points by tricking the discriminator into accepting one of their fakes. And the discriminator scores points by busting the forger for faking, for, for you know, one of their fakes. And these things will, it's like an evolutionary arms race. You, you just run these things against each other long enough. It's like two computers, two versions of the same algorithm playing chess against each other. You can you basically can train something to be very good at chess. Likewise, you can train something to create photographic, realistic portraits of non-existent people. And um, you can also include various kinds of styles and filters. And this person took this picture of a cup of coffee and let the AI run with it. And this is what the AI is seeing. So this is a kind of stylized, creative pareidolia. Um, now, as I said, interpretability, this is, this is the area of AI safety that I've sort of stumbled into. And it's this idea of these neural networks when, when they don't have just a few dozen neurons in each layer, but they have tens of millions of neurons and they have dozens of layers and all of the neurons are joined to all the other neurons with these lines. I mean, you couldn't draw a picture of it, it would just be a mess. And these things can get so big and so, um, just, well, intractable in terms of understanding what's going on that they, it seems that they are starting to create their own subsystems. It's almost like they, they've learned to code in some weird sense. Um, they're doing things we wouldn't have expected. They seem to be able to learn in ways we haven't anticipated. And no one's quite sure what's going on inside there. And it's kind of about time we started to find out before things go badly wrong. Um, not badly wrong in the Terminator sense. Um, but, you know, this is what people often bring up when I talk about AI safety. They've seen the movie. Um, we're not worried about the thing becoming conscious and then deciding to kill us all. Um, we're worried about the thing becoming misaligned, where we, the, you, you give it a purpose and then it takes you too literally and um, basically tries to seize control of all the world's resources in order to do the thing you asked it to do as effectively as possible um, and does it in a way that you, you haven't noticed was happening because it's figured out exactly how human psychology and society works so it can always outwit us. And before we realize what's going on, we're all dead. That's the kind of nightmare scenario that some people are worrying about. Not quite this. 
Um, but there's a team at Google Deep Dream, uh, Google Deep Mind, which is the Google AI um, team, who are getting started on what's called interpretability uh, or feature visualization, looking inside these neural networks, specifically the image-based ones. There are neural networks which translate languages, which can write poetry, which can play chess, which can identify pop songs. I mean, you've probably used Shazam. There's apps like that. And anything like that is, is uh, probably running a neural network. Um, but the, the visual ones, the ones which work with visual imagery, are the best ones to get started on with in terms of um, uh, seeing what's going on, literally seeing what's going on, because you can see stuff. So if we go back to the neural network, the, uh, um, let's see, uh, basic neural network um, here. Now, if I want to know what is that neuron doing, okay, if I put, I, I feed a picture through and it spits out some kind of guess as to what the picture is, I think, okay, so it's, it's got a bunch of weights that are, which are parameterizing its synapses. You're feeding it an image, it's simply following the rules of simple arithmetic and giving you an answer. So why is that neuron sometimes firing, sometimes not firing? What is it about that neuron? What's that neuron's role in identifying whether that's a picture of a zebra or a giraffe? You know, which, which of the neurons recognizes the long neck or the black and white stripes? Well, there's a way of testing for that by using another network to create, to generate images, a bit like those crazy ones I showed you, um, to generate images in order to create the optimal activation in that neuron. So you basically say, okay, neuron, I want to see what really gets you excited, what really activates you. So I'm going to start by showing you just some random visual noise. And I'm going to tweak it in various directions. And when I notice that you're getting a bit more activated, I'll keep going that way. Um, it's called gradient descent. It's like trying to find your way down a hill. You know, you sort of step in various directions, and then you find the direction that's got the steepest downward, and you go that way, and then you keep doing that. You'll eventually find yourself at the bottom. So we, we, want, to, we want to use gradient descent to act to figure out what kind of image is going to maximally, optimally activate a specific neuron. And that's what the Deep Dream team were doing with this feature visualization stuff. And this is the stuff they found. Um, so this is the early, one, of the, one of the early layers of the network, which seems to respond to these kind of ripply patterns. Like, it looks like sand, you know, when, when the tide's gone out. Notice the orientations. They, they, they're the line of sort of parallel lines at a certain orientation. There are colors involved, which are relevant. They're not just lines. They have these kind of slight irregularities in them. So in other words, if I showed this, so that's a particular neuron right there we're looking at. That's what that neuron really, really wants to see. That will really activate the neuron. Something which looks a bit like that, something which has got some lines going that way, more or less, will activate that neuron more or less. But that's really what it's looking for. So we're creating these kind of archetypal images which show us, this is the next layer, the next layer seems to be interested in these sorts of abstract patterns. But I no one designed these images, right? What you're looking at here, this is not art. This is looking inside a system which has trained itself to recognize objects that we have named and labeled. Um, and it, this is the way it's breaking imagery down. And it's kind of weird and fascinating. You can kind of almost see the dogs starting to emerge there. Um, so the next layer, we've got what they call patterns. Then we start to see sort of bits of things. So it looks a bit like sort of electronic consoles, obviously sort of vegetation, textiles, sort of insectoid stuff, dog noses, sort of blurry or sort of blobby fungus things. And then you start to get into more like objects, architecture, clothing, pastries, maybe, uh, reptilian eyes, more sort of insectoid stuff and floppy ears. So again, I'll just to, it's, it's hard to keep track of all this, but that right there is a neuron in the network, one of those circles in that diagram. You show it that, you feed that into the network, it goes through, guesses what it is, we don't really care. That neuron is going off the meter when it sees that. It's the floppy ear neuron. Um, but we just did not expect that. We didn't know what these things were doing, but they, they seem to be responding to these. Um, now, as you go deeper into the network, you start to see, well, Here's some examples of actual pictures that triggered a neuron. So there was a specific neuron that seemed to really respond to pictures of baseballs and wheel hubs with sort of radial lines, and in this case, uh, a fan. So you can kind of see what these have got in common. 
sort of. But if you said, okay, Neuron, show me what really you want to see, and you run this optimization process, you end up with this. That's going to create the most activation in that neuron, more than any of these. So it's kind of all of them and none of them, but what is it? What is that thing? I mean, we don't have a name for that thing. You don't see one of those and go, oh, yeah, it's one of those things. This has got some, again, some sort of dog face stuff going on here, but it doesn't look like a dog. It's a sort of omni dog. Um, clouds and bits of sort of braided fabric, and then sort of skies and pagodas. And it just gets weirder as you go on. Um, but these, are, these aren't too weird, but these are, again, they're not patterns we have names for, but yeah, they seem to be elements of visual understanding at some almost mathematical level. So these are pictures that that neuron seemed to like. So herons and storks and things with bendy necks, sort of, sort of sinusoidal corkscrew type forms. It seemed to like those. And again, you can almost see the bits of dog coming out. The dogs get everywhere, it's amazing. Um, these sort of bits of fur, again, these are the pictures that that neuron liked. There was a wooden spoon lot in there. So it's kind of the orangey brown color, but it's also this sort of downward fur texture. Um, these, there was a neuron that seemed to like balls from various sports, but when you ask it to show you what it really wants to see, it kind of wants to see this like amalgam of all of them. Um, now, this is where this is where I get really interested, where there are certain neurons that seem to be mashups of unrelated things. So there's a neuron that responds to cars, car bodies, and cats. It's the car cat neuron. And when you ask it to show you what it really wants to see, it shows you these amazing mashup car cat things. Um, and so the, 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 the researchers were like, oh, something seems to be wrong here. We need to separate this out. We wanted it to be the case that there was a neuron for cars and a neuron for cats, but it's not. It's kind of messy and it's all wrong. We need to, we need to do some kind of mathematical transformation on this setup so that we get these neat axes where things are separated. But it doesn't seem that's possible. All the, all the work thus far suggests that, no, there is an intrinsic mashing up of imagery that is part of understanding what you're looking at. And this, to me, suggests maybe we're looking at the world wrong. Um, that we bro We've broken the world down into categories and named them. And then we've given the computer lots of examples of these objects, named, categorized, labeled objects, and it's learned to recognize them better than we can. And yet, when you look inside the mechanics of it, you see that it's like using these as its kind of building blocks. Um, now, I showed an, uh, a friend of mine who's an artist, not, not remotely interested or aware of any of this technology stuff, explained the basics, and I showed her these. And she said, oh, that neuron must be optimizing for sleekness. So she immediately thought of a quality that the cars and cats had in common. And, and so, yeah, so that's a clever answer. It's a sort of sleekness neuron. But it could be how many other things do we not have names for? I mean, you start to get very strange once you, um, you know, that's, that's a particular neuron. That's the neuron that wants to see that. And it likes these, but it really likes that. Um, and then, uh, let's see, let's guess. There's some really very, very strange ones that show up later, polysemantic neurons. Um, so yeah, there's the car cat neuron. You know, most neurons seem routine to respond to an incomprehensible melange of inputs. So the researchers are scratching their heads. They don't understand what's going on um, or why this is happening. But to me, it suggests partly the way that we've trained these things is, is culturally bound. We've, we've given it our categories of ob named objects, and we tend to assume that those are built into the world, but they're not. They're arbitrary labels that we've, we've broken the world, we've chunked the world into categories and named them. And so we, we seem to be getting some kind of feedback from our own chunking process coming back at us through. So here's where it seems to be making sense, where this neuron seems to like tops of cars, this neuron seems to like sort of bodies of cars, and this neuron seems to like wheels. And these neurons are all firing into this neuron in the next layer. So if it's got all three, it really likes that. So it's kind of it's like, oh, this is the car detector neuron. But then later on, the car detector neuron smears its output all over the next layer um, and mashes it up with all sorts of dogs and things. Um, yeah, here we go. So the car detector then feeds into these. Like, what the hell are they? No one knows. Everybody's just really confused by this stuff. So our attempts to look inside these um, artificial neural networks and understand what's going on. It's just led to this unexpected splurge of, of psychedelic art, um, except it's all kind of just pure mathematics riding on top of our the, the topography of our own 
scheme of classifying objects in the world. Um, at the, the earlier layers, it's a bit more straightforward. So you've got these types of um, neurons which respond to this kind of thing. So you go, okay, sort of big little pieces of curve. All right, we can relate, that's easy enough. But they're not just little pieces of curve, they're like little pieces of curve with colors on opposite and different colors on opposite sides, specific orientations, and this weird ruffled silk kind of uh, effect. And nobody's got any idea why that's the case, but neurons really like that. And then you get enough of them firing together and you get these more complex curves built out of the little curves. So as you saw in the first ones I showed, you start off with just like zigzaggy line things, and then you get textures built from those, and then you get patterns built from the textures and then objects built from the patterns. Um, this is, yeah, again, dog, dog detection neurons. Um, doing very strange things. So I don't know what to make of any of this. I've, I put it to the um, people in this area of research that maybe um, they ought to consider the fact that the way they're grouping these neurons is, is culturally bound in the sense that, um, so they're taking the whole layers of the neural network and then they're generating a picture for each neuron and then they're trying to put them together in groups. So these groups you see here, are the result of someone sitting around a table with lots of different pictures going, oh, these lot all look the same. This lot here have all got this kind of speckled pattern on half of them and then this sort of blurry pattern on the other half. Let's put those in a group. Now, these groups look quite sensible to me on the whole. They look like, oh, yeah, I can see why you put those together. I'd see why you put those together. But then you get other units, catch-all category for all other units. In other words, they don't know. They just don't know what to do with those. And the deeper you go into the network, the more you get... Um, things like uh, low confidence organizational category. We don't really understand these units. Low confidence category, low confidence category. In other words, they don't really know what they're doing. They're just putting them together in, to the best of their ability. Um, like, I don't know, biologists have landed on an alien planet that are sort of trying to classify all the different species without any real understanding of how they evolved, just looking at them and thinking, well, that one looks a bit like that one. And I suggested maybe the way that the people in this, this, this research team have grouped these is partly shaped by their own mode of cognition, which would be culturally bound. And maybe we ought to be bringing people from radically different cultures in to look at these pictures and see what they see and how they group them. And maybe we'd learn something about that. But that's, that's another line of research, um, which I may or may not pursue. Anyway, I think I've gone on a bit. I'll stop now. So I hope that all made some sense. Thank you. Right, well, uh, questions, and yeah, uh, Rennie. Um, has anyone used the data-driven clustering to cluster uh, instead of no, top-down? I mean, no, I've not come across that. It might be worth, no, I'm not sure. I, I mean, that working feature visualization seems to have fizzled out a couple of years ago. They got quite excited about it at first, and then I think it was just, oh, what do we do with this? And they've all moved on. Yeah. So that might be something to look into. Hi, that, that was a really great talk. Thank you. Um, I, th I think there is not really like a scientific answer to this, so I'm just asking for your hunch, yeah. your best possible assumption is, um, how is human neural processing different from this? Like, are the categories that we use for things, are they just superficial and is our processing in the background in any way corresponding? to how, how computers do it. I think at the deepest layers, there's some correspondence. So there, um, for example, when you look at the early layers of those neural networks, you get these things um, called Gabor filters, which, are, which we know the brain uses for recognizing basically just lines at certain angles and, and patterns of contrast, I think. Um, so neuroscientists have discovered Gabor filters are used in the human visual processing system. And they also show up in the deepest, reliably, these vision models, all different algorithms. You look at the earliest layers, you always get these gap or filters. But as you move into the deeper and deeper layers, it gets weirder and more alien to us. And it feels like there are so many different ways. If you look at all the different human cultures and the way we've trained ourselves to see the world. So, I mean, there's research that shows that certain optical illusions that work on us may not work on someone from another culture, for example, because even though we sort of assume everyone's looking, looking and seeing the same thing, it seems they're not. We see the world differently. So if you imagine all of the, the huge range of different ways that humans could be in culture, the ones that exist on this planet and the ones that could have done, um, all of those would have led to different, uh, what would you say, sort of configurations of those neural networks. 
And so if you were to peer in them, you'd see different stuff at the deeper layers. At the earliest layers, you'd see the same things, which seem to just emerge reliably as a baby is making sense of the world. And then as you start pointing at things and naming them, like as you know, the typical way you would culture a small child is you go chair, window, cloud, dog, and the child repeats that after you and you give them feedback, you praise them or whatever, based on how well they're doing. And that's different in different cultures and the way we chunk the world is different in different cultures. So we end up with, we, we configure our biological neural networks differently. Whereas these artificial ones, they're just, I mean, it's just a purely mathematical exercise, but it's the, the, the any weirdness we see is reflecting to some extent the categorization scheme that we've given it. So it's reflecting back something yeah. about us. And then psychedelics are in some way peering into that. It would appear so, yeah. I mean, it feels like we're, we're looking at, we're getting an inside look at what it, uh, at a computer tripping or something like that. Yeah, you know, that's, that's what it looks, that's what most people yeah. feel when they see that for the first time. So it feels like if you take psychedelics, your internal visuals or your kind of projected visuals are perhaps showing you something of the, um, Something and perhaps analogous to those those visualizations, but I really don't understand why that would be the case. I, I don't know. And so, you just want, do you think that's like a truer way of seeing the world? I don't know if there is a truer closer. way. Well, like it's like just closer to, to reality, the, the real. In a way, I, 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 I sort of sometimes feel that. I mean, it looks like we're here. We're looking at some kind of building blocks of visual the visual world and they they look strange to us they look kind of wrong but they're not so it suggests maybe we are maybe those images wouldn't look strange to us if we saw the world correctly and we're not seeing it correctly that's an idea i've entertained and the fact that they kind of look like psychedelic imagery then feeds into this idea that psychedelics give you some sort of uh deeper insight into the true nature of things which i think you have to be a bit careful with that you know i'm you know, I've gone there. I, I'm, I'm, I'm guilty of that. But, uh, I, I, yeah, this, I don't know. I, I yeah, can't no, say. It would be good if it was confirmed, but it could also be a coincidence. Thank you. Any more questions in here? Otherwise, Adrian, Adrian, do you wanna speak? Yep, sure. Fantastic talk. And as somebody uh, a bit obsessed with pareidolia, it was uh, it was amazing to see all that. But um, quick question: um, some, something you said then about categorization. Um, I noticed that when you look, read about people talking about the sort of AlphaGo program that was taught to play chess um, in a very similar way, that they they classified the moves that were made as sort of almost alien moves because um, everybody had been taught to play chess. By a particular set of sort of rules that are come down from the, handed down from the grand masters, so they never even saw sort of early moves with high levels of sacrifice to open up the game. Do you think that is going back to your your point about categorization? Do you think there's some of that here that effectively we've been so linguistically categorized to sort of bunch things together with by by the simple names that we don't see other patterns that might always have been there? Oh. Um. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm familiar with the AlphaGo thing. Um, the, the, there was one particular move. I'm not, I'm not so aware of it with chess. I mean, obviously the chess, yeah. chess computer, shoulder move. There was this particular move in a particular game of Go against Lee Sedol that made everybody gasp out loud because nobody had thought yeah. of this move. Um, but that came about simply because of the, the depth of search. The thing is able to look so deeply into the game. It's able to see things we can't see rather than seeing different patterns. It's more uh just this sort of immensity of the sort of combinatorial scope of the thing so I, i'm not sure i mean it has something it feels it's got a similar feel this alien quality to it i'd agree but i think that mm. the roots of that maybe are would be hard to relate to to that to the um game playing stuff okay fabulous thank you any other questions in here okay i've got a i've got a question um Great that you brought in Brian Froud. Do, do you know him at all? No, I may have bumped into him in Frankfurt and not really. Only that's that picture I just found the other day. I didn't know what he looked like until oh, right. then. So I may have seen, you know, he was well, around, didn't he? I, I've met him a few times and I, I, I was a big Labyrinth fan in the 80s. So I sort of got it. Oh, he did the design for Labyrinth. He designed the Goblin yeah, yeah, and the um, layouts for that and uh, Dark Crystal. Dark Crystal, yeah. yeah. And um, yeah, and so on. Anyway, um, I did, I, funnily enough, I, I actually interviewed him in Glastonbury about whether he had taken psychedelics, <laughs> trying to link it, and he hasn't at all. Um, but he is, when you spoke of the 
the controversy over him um, sort of being shady about fact and fiction there. I mean, he's, he's a true believer. He really does believe in the actuality of little and people. Would he claim that the, his, his graphic art is reflecting what he's seen in terms of sense? Uh, yeah, pretty right. much. Yeah. And, but he's obviously prone to see faces uh, more than most, or yeah. at least uh, in most cases. But um, it's interesting what you said. You, you had two kind of speculations about why uh, one might see faces in nature. Um, one is, of course, threat. Mm. Possible threat, and I, and certainly in my experience, I've I've uh, seen faces and sort of um before I've conceptualized who it was, I've 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 had a, a sort of emotional response, which is um, you know in the one particular case fearful. <laughs> but um, you said something that was one that's one explanation, an evolutionary threat situation, which makes sense. Um, but there was another one which sort of uh, the, the interesting it, kind of the yeah the that, that there was actually. actually the faces are your subjective representation of some, of presences or beings that are actually out there. This would be more aligned with Brian Fry's own yeah. metaphysics or beliefs. Um, but so my question to, to you would be this, like what would be the mode of perception that could pick up those kind of presences that then were represented mm. in a facial form? Of course, this also interestingly relates to the animism that is believed in by... Um, Amerindian cultures mm. in relation to their psychedelic experience. But the main question is this, yeah, what would be the main um, mode of perception that picked up those presences almost subconsciously? I mean, it reminds me of Wordsworth, you know, when he's talking about sort of presences that he feels in nature, the other romantic poets as well. I, yeah, I really don't know what that mechanism is. I'm not sure there is one. You know, it's, I, I haven't committed to believing in this. It's just the, the, just the body of... of uh, anecdotal and, and other sort of uh, accounts of people claiming to have felt presences and my own feel and sense of having felt presences is something there. It, well, it, it, it seems there's something going on, but what is that? It could just be, I'm just picking up on lots of little cues through my, you know, through the ordinary sensory modalities and somehow combining them in some way. Um, but who knows, maybe we have access to something else subtle that we, we have yet to name or, I mean, or account for. Yeah, uh, what came to my mind was Alfred North Whitehead has this concept of prehension, which is no, okay. just prehension, and it's a form of um, it's a kind of primal form of perception, which is uh, not related to the later five senses okay. and, and more, but um, a kind of absorption of emotion of other presences in nature, which oh. is related to nature connectedness in terms yeah. of psychedelic uh, um, clinical trials at the moment. Anyway, there's an interesting That's the only research. name I've heard given it, but yeah, it would right. be that, yeah. Bergson also has something called sympathy, which is related to it. It's his specific form of sympathy. Um, interesting one. Yeah, uh, you want? I, I was just wondering regarding this, so like the way in which you were talking about it, obviously is that, you know, that the, these particular connections seem to indicate that there's some kind of fondness for like, this particular visual stimuli or there's like a search for it. And then, um, I was just curious as to how much has this been done, like to sort of like this be, like feeding of images and then seeing like which what are the preferences and also is there something like this done for sound? Um, yeah, sound would be. I don't know if anyone has done this kind of feature. Um, so that's what you what I was showing is called feature visualization. Mm -hmm. So like I said, you're you're basically trying to opt to create something which will optimally activate a neuron in a visual network. If you had a network which was able to identify bird song or speech recognition or something like that. You could do exactly the same thing where you created something which started with white noise and then kept tweaking it until it was creating a sound which was getting that neuron activated. And then you go, okay, that, that neuron seems to like strange sort of, you know, fluctuating tones in this wave band. Or, so you could, you could do it with speech recognition. You'd, you'd find little phonemes or syllables perhaps showing up or strange mashups of them. I'm not aware of any research this stuff that was going on with the feature visualization is quite recent. You need, in, you need a lot of computing power to do this work. So it's like a Google sponsored project and it hasn't got any immediate um, commercial application. It's, it's kind of long-term safety type research that may or may not be helpful. So I think, it, like I said, it kind of fizzled out. I don't think they could justify the budgets or they moved on to what they felt might be more useful things. So, um, I'm not aware of anyone doing it with sound or any of the other types of neural networks, but it could be done. Um, and the stuff, the visual stuff, yeah, there was one team doing it quite extensively for about three years. I showed you like bits of four of their papers. 
and then it seems to have just kind of <coughs> trail just kind of went cold because they everybody was just a bit weirded out by it and then it's like well, what, what can you do with this um the first thought was can we can we straighten it out can we regularize it and make it make sense and, and it seemed you couldn't so then they kind of gave up yeah, thank you. Any further questions? Did Adrian again? Are you asking another question, Adrian, or did you not put your hand down? Apologies, no, I forgot to put my hand down. Okay. Andy, any thoughts? Uh, hi, everyone. Um, Great talk. I, I have to go to another another call, so um, uh, it'll have to save it for another time. But um, yeah, really, really fascinating. Thank you. And he's about to be interviewed by Vice. I know he told me earlier today. All oh, right. So, yeah. Good luck with Andy. Um, yes. Um, I I would like to hear more about the link with creativity. I think I told you everything I know. So, I mean, I'll, maybe I'll just run over it again in case it didn't make sense the first time, because I, well, I don't know if I did make sense. Um, so, first of all, nobody really, the, the, the authors, the Canadian authors of the study I cited, they admit we don't really know what we mean by creativity. It's a very ill-formed notion, um, but there's a lot of interest in it for various reasons. So, I assume in the psychology literature, studies of creativity have used various means of quantifying something you know uh i guess things like word association games and i don't know um and so you can you can take a group of people and you can rate them in terms of their creativity according to that metric but you could use different metrics and you probably get slightly different results um and these people were interested in um finding other ways of measuring creative i think just like quick and easy ways of measuring creativity. I mean, it'd be quite useful for, say, corporate recruitment or something like that. I, I, I fear that this may have been the, the motive because they were looking at pareidolia, not because they're interested in pareidolia, but because it might be a proxy measure for creativity. And I was interested in their result because I'm interested in the pareidolia, because what they seemed to suggest was that more creative people, according to their measure, um, were more readily able to see um, more types of forms emerging from random noise. And then, as, as I mentioned later, Leonardo da Vinci wrote in his notebooks that he was able to, he wrote as if anyone could do this, but it was obviously yeah. from, you know, you could just look at some peeling paint or something and start to see amazing scenes emerge. And then he was skillful enough to be able to capture them. So there is, unsurprisingly to me anyway, it's a link between more creatively minded, imaginative people. People have more access to the world of imagination. Brian Froud, for example, probably has loads of pareidolia um, and he's a very creative person. Um, but then I was thinking, but psychedelics enhance creativity according to many of these measures and many studies, I believe. Um, and so psychedelics temporarily create more creativity and during that window of time, presumably that heightened creativity would allow increased pareidolia. So that's a third reason why, so, uh, you know, this, this thing, if you're in the woods, taking psychedelics and you saw things coming out of the trees at you, it might be a survival value because you're in a heightened state of sensitivity. It might be because they're actually there and you're, you're somehow able to like, perceive them. And, or it might be that your creativity has been enhanced and creativity leads to more paradoxical. But then what is this creativity thing? If, if it's just a link in that chain, what is it doing? You know, we think of creativity as people being able to make nice bits of art or something, but it seems to be something else besides the obvious application. Yeah, that's what interests me the most, I think, is can we use um, pareidolia rather than uh, like as a corporate tool and psychedelics as well? Can we use them mm. to like reverse engineer what creativity is? I, I'm sure they're working on that. I mean, yeah. there are people who would love to be able to um, you know, the, 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 the Silicon Valley microdosing scene is all about, it's not about opening your mind to, uh, you know, the, the wider aspects of reality as much as coming up with innovative solutions, you know, to be more competitive. Um, but there's some interesting side effects to that, of course. It's an interesting link. You mentioned hypnagogia in yeah. relation to this. And I think 50% of people I read once uh, have that. 50% mm. 
some people do not. Oh, really? um, so hypnagogia, do you know what that is? So on the cusp of sleep and sometimes on the cusp of full awakening. That's hypnopompia. That's okay. So on the cusp of sleep, hypnagogia, right? Um, you, you're not fully awake, but you're not sleeping. It's not a dream. It's not narrative in any way, but, but you, with eyes closed, you, you have many psychedelic-like vi visions. I would, not as strong, but certainly in the same sort of category. Yeah, lots of, lots of things morphing into other things, faces yeah. coming out of things. So the sand grain faces were the most hypnagogic, right. of the ones least in my experience. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I have it a lot, um, but some of my friends have never heard of it. So of interest, who has that? <laughs> you know, about half, a bit more than half of you, okay. But I wonder, I mean, often yeah, you do see faces, so so that could be a, a recognition within those sort of random swirls. Or... Yeah, and it's, it's slightly different from pareidolia because there's no external nebulous field from which you're drawing the thing. But is there not? Because if you, know, you don't get complete blankness when you yeah. close your eyes, of course, do you? You do see, but we, yeah. we don't conceptualise that, but, you know, you never see a you're going to Perfect. get some kind of noise, and then you can mm. start to interpret the noise. Exactly. Yeah, so I think it, yeah, maybe it could be considered as a subcategory. I almost included it, but I was a bit. So I wonder if that's correlated with hypnagogia and faces and seeing it in, in uh, very, not vertically, but externally as well. So a lot more research to be done, obviously. Yeah, I, I, one of the things that struck me in doing this, putting together this talk, was how little has been done mm. and how much. I mean, I'm I'm not inclined to follow up any of this stuff. It's just not my thing. But it feels like there's like three or four different PhDs that could be done <laughs> yeah. out based on this thing. Yes. And if you're, if you're interested in that, if you're watching this later on, do, do email us. Um, good. Uh, any further questions? There's one from, is there someone online who has a question? I can't see it. Andy left the question. Oh, right, in the chat, sorry. We'll leave this question. Whether the psilocybin brain imaging experiments should increase activity in the face recognition parts of the brain. Do you know? I don't. I don't know. Actually, I didn't get a chance to look into that. I don't know either. I doubt it. Why do you doubt it? Um, because in the imperial study, there was a surprisingly less activity than was anticipated. Overall, yeah. Overall, yeah. So that's why I doubt it. But I'm not sure. Okay. Time. I guess we're out of time. Um, can you all thank again Matthew Watkins? Thank you. Continue this in another place.